All right, tonight we have the town manager and the deputy town manager, Jim and Alex McGee, who will talk about your budget and answer other questions and talk about a few issues that have come up. Right. So sure. I'll just turn it over to you, Jim. Sure. Sarah, did we have oh, slides? Oh, yes. Sorry. Yes. Sure. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, as the chair mentioned, I'm Jim Feeney. I am the town manager. With me tonight is Alex McGee, Deputy Town Manager and Finance Director. No. Many of you I know, and a few of you have our, I've already met this evening. So good evening. Uh, pleased to be here. Happy to uh, have the time to walk you through the proposed fiscal year uh, 2025 budget. Uh, tonight we'll do an overview of the budget process, an overview at a high level of the budget itself, speak to some of the, what we'll call the budget highlights, inc including maintaining the board's override commitments and investments in response to community needs, review the long-term outlook, i.e. the long range plan, as well as uh, the next steps. And before I turn it over to Alex to go into the details, uh, as Christine mentioned, you know, we'll, as we circle around to the end of the presentation, review some of the, uh, you know, new news that we've received, but it, you know, it has been a bit of a, you know, what I'll say, a tumultuous budget season already. Uh, as many folks know, you know, this uh, committee voted on prior to the special town meeting in the fall, the issue with the fiscal year 2024 override. So, you know, we were starting in a position where we did not collect that $7 million in fiscal year 2024, instead pushing to uh, fiscal year 2025. And then we initially received, you know, about a month ago, the news from the Group Insurance Commission, the GIC, that uh, we we're going to see a significant uh, premium rate increase this year, uh, on aggregate estimated between 8 and 10%. They don't hone in on that until uh, early March. Needless to say, we generally carry a 5% increase there, and it's a very large budget. So that was you know, a, a, an over $1 million hurdle that we've already dealt with. And uh, as alluded to the uh, governor's budget, H2 did not bring the best of news for the town of Arlington. Uh, at, the, at the highest level we carried uh, for chapter 70 state aid, we were projecting uh, in the previously approved long range plan of 5% growth rate on education aid, given what we had seen in recent years and as a result of the ongoing implementation of the Student Opportunity Act. However, that came in at roughly 1%. So that resulted in yet another uh, sort of fiscal year 25 hit on the order of magnitude of about $650,000. Uh, it was actually a bigger hit on the education side, but we budgeted for 1% growth in unrestricted general government aid, and that actually came in at 3% offsetting a bit of that uh, shortfall or deficit. So just wanted to point out some of you know the, the hurdles that we know we're facing. We certainly don't yet have solutions for all of them, but look forward to you know, certainly working with this committee to find our way through it. So I'll turn it, through, turn it to Alex to sort of talk through some of the specifics and we'll be going back and forth. <clears throat> all right, next slide. Perfect. So um, a little bit about our budget process is a lot of you are very likely aware, but some of you may not be, so we're going to run over it. Um, this is a this is a long endeavor. It takes a large portion of the fiscal year to complete our uh, budget process work. I'd say probably like somewhere between 60 and 75 percent through the process at this point. Um, so this starts um, really in earnest in August with our capital planning. Uh, we launch by asking our department heads to um, work with within their departments to figure out what their capital needs are. They do a five-year um, look out, and then they say, all right, this is what we want. We hope people uh, bring their needs for five years out. And then as the plan moves forward through the years, we are able to meet those uh, needs and fund them appropriately. Inevitably, we always have things that become critical, and so we have to reshuffle the deck every year. And so that is uh, involves the work of the Capital Planning Committee. The work in earnest is uh, mostly November, December, um, and then there's a little bit of a lag. And then um, we begin sort of report building, um, starting really tomorrow is when that will kick off again. Um, 
the operating budgets really start their development in earnest in sort of November, late October, November. Um, our department heads, uh, we distribute materials to them, explain sort of what situation, uh, what we believe the situation to be for the next fiscal year to be. Um, and so they plan for any new expense requests um, they may have. So what we call their ordinary expenses, and it's not personnel related. And then we work together with all of our department heads to work on all of our personnel and salary sheets. Um, brings us to the January through April timeframe. Uh, you all folks are beginning, or sort of really into the teeth of your work now, um, dissecting all the departmental budgets. Um, the budget was um, really put together by um, town manager, myself, uh, Julie Wayman, who's our previous budget director, now is the town's treasurer, she's recently promoted, um, and Gail Dixon, who's our soon to be departing budget director. Um, we can talk about that later. Um, but um, so the, the budget was delivered um, January, I think, 12th to the select board and the FinCom chair. And uh, now you all are doing um, your work. Um, over the next couple of months, uh, I'll be working in our office to develop the financial plan, which is sort of the uh, bigger budget book that we all love, um, April's town meeting. And then hopefully uh, we have a budget that is adopted and appropriated in May. And then at the end of June, we're turning the clock uh, again for a new fiscal year. So uh, that's process, sort of long-winded. All right, next slide, please. All right, so budget overview. Um, this is just a snapshot of uh, our budget broken into different categories. Um, this is the revenue side of the page. Um, this usually grows at a pretty steady increment. Uh, as we all know, um, there is an override that is being applied in FY25. So we'll see a pretty significant jump in our property tax growth in FY25. Um, our other funds, you'll also notice there's a huge decrease there. Um, if you don't see that, I'm not sure, but uh, we don't have the ability to spend ARPA money as a general revenue offset next year. So we've already tapped that to the tune of $10 million, which is the cap. So um, we cannot use ARPA for like a revenue replacement anymore in the future. Um, and so that, uh, you know, ARPA funding really is what allowed the town to sort of squeeze a couple, or really about a full year out of the last override a little further. Um, maybe next slide. So this gives you a sense of revenue categories, um, just a visual breakdown. Um, the lion's share, so 75% comes from property taxes. Um, local receipts make up about 5%. Um, state aid in various forms make up about 13%. And then the remainder, um, about 7% total, is broken up into some other smaller categories, um, including free cash, which um, in recent years, we've had record free cash, so that um, does help to offset our next year's operating budget. We have a policy where we spend 50% of our previous year's certified free cash um, as, a, as a revenue source. Uh, next slide, please. All right, expenditures. So this is um, sort of the, the working plan for our budget for next year. Um, some high-level notes. Um, we are growing our municipal departments by, um, we'll talk more about this in detail, but about 3.22%. Um, this remains sort of under our growth cap. Um, the number looks like it's a little higher, but we have a three, a $250,000 override dollar values that's added into this um, figure. Uh, and that is to help offset our looming solid waste and recycling issue that contract expires at the end of fiscal 2025. Um, and so that is something that is ongoing and will become a pretty big challenge in the future, in the near future. Um, what else? So uh, schools, um, the Arlington Public School Department grew at a pretty high clip this year. Um, a lot of that in FY25, a lot of that comes in the form of override commitments. Um, the override was really built around funding the schools at uh, more appropriate levels. Uh, and so the, the um, growth there was eight, it totaled out at 8%. Um, again, that was held to 3.5% uh, per the commitments for general ed, 6.5% for special ed growth, and then a $3.1 million increase over the top of that. Um, 
What else? Uh, warrant articles. Um, looks like we have a, high, a large percentage jump there, but um, it's really not a huge dollar figure. Those flex up and down annually based on what sorts of warrant articles are coming before the town. We're looking, we're exploring ways to further offset that. There may be some opportunity to offset some of that with ARPA funding um, for some of the warrant articles that we are looking a little deeper into that. So um, all in, we're looking at a, about a 6% increase over FY24. Go to the next slide, please. Um, again, this is our expenditure breakdown, uh, just a visual representation. You'll see that the orange and the gray slivers uh, or slices of the pie, those make up our education in general, the gray being Minuteman, uh, orange being the Arlington School Department, public school department. Uh, so together they make up about 48% of our budget. Um, top right, the darker blue looking wedge of the, of the pie, which is about 20%. Those are sort of the town municipal operations. Um, yellow on the left side, that is your, so sort of we look at that as um, overhead. It's not tied to department. It's also this healthcare, pensions, that sort of thing. Um, the second largest blue wedge on the top left, that's capital. Uh, and that um, that is a, uh, you know, fairly significant piece of the pie. And then the remainder, we have a 1% uh, FinCom reserve fund, um, warrant articles at 1%, and then overlay reserve, which we uh, reserve in anticipation of not fully collecting all property taxes and allowing for abatements of taxes. Um, now I'll turn it back to Jim for some highlights. Sure, next slide. So I know, I believe your folks were distributed what, uh, I understand the finance team calls the budget explainer, but sort of the roadmap of what is new this year. Thought I would touch upon some of what we'll call the highlights. Uh, as Alex noted, total expenditure growth was at 6.3%, but if you control for uh, some of the override commitments, which I wanted to illustrate here, just to further demonstrate that the uh, spending commitments were met. So. Uh, absent the override commitments, you'd see town growth of $1,332,000 or approximately 3.22%. Again, there's a 3.25% cap. We don't necessarily view that as the target. We view that as the cap of which you would go up to, but we, uh, you know, some capacity remains there. And then across, uh, you know, school growth was at 4.5%. 6% if you remove the FY25 uh, override commitment of $3.1 million. And again, that is sort of a blended rate because that includes both general education, which is allowed to grow at 3.5% in conjunction with special ed, which now grows at a, uh, a rate of 6.5%. Uh, so Alex alluded to, you know, much like you are beginning to dissect the town budgets, we spend a significant amount of time uh, dissecting the departmental budget requests. We get sheets with new requests this year. Uh, department had submitted 38 requests total uh, for a value of $830,000 in uh, new expenses. Obviously, as we work through our process meeting with department heads, we uh, whittled that down to funding 20 new requests, many of which were at uh, a level probably significantly below uh, the requested figure. So the town uh, expense increases totaled $270,000, 717. Uh, what made up the bulk of this increase was uh, the MTP pay and classification plan, which was uh, introducing a ninth step to that plan. And that is for sort of uh, middle, what I'd call middle management folks within the organization. They are non-union, they are a collective bargaining unit, but they would generally follow the ATP group, which is a collectively bargaining group, you know, whatever agreement they had reached. Unfortunately, we weren't able to fund that ninth step last year, though it had been committed. So we're following through on that commitment within the FY25 budget uh, to meet that earlier commitment. Uh, you know, a big jump in electricity. So noting utility costs here, we're adding $55,000 to the uh, facilities department's budget. We'll know, you know, we do 
competitively procure in bulk our supply. That contract does uh, expire each December, though we're locked in for multiple years. So we just saw in December of 2023, so for our January meter reads, our supply rate has gone up 46%. You couple that with a 10% increase on the distribution and transmission side for winter rates on Eversource, it results across the board in a pretty big spike in electricity costs. Also a bump in uh, the facilities department for maintenance contract increases. Again, those are things we procure in three year intervals via a competitive process. And with each year of that agreement, oftentimes the chosen vendor has built in some sort of escalator. You know, the largest contract usually is the custodial contract for the overnight nighttime uh, cleaning that takes place. But we also have contracts for uh, elevator service and maintenance, uh, roof maintenance. We have an electrical contract, a plumbing contract, an HVAC contract, and all of those hourly rates go up each year. So uh, it's sort of a contractual increase being funded there. There are also some additions in the information technology budget uh, that are new this year. Uh, so one is a dedicated internet service provider. And so a, a new data line, in fact, for this building to support uh, the upcoming body worn camera program for the Allen's police department. So the sheer amount and size of those video files that needs to be handled and processed on a daily basis, the best practice is to, in fact, have it have its own internet line instead of, you know, adding on to the to the existing fiber in the building. Uh, we're also pursuing seemingly for the first time, but in response to sort of a growing threat to our networks is uh, deploying some, you know, actual investments in cybersecurity. Uh, so you may have read my budget message. It seems that and if you've read some news about Lowell and some other uh, water utilities that, in fact, uh, municipal entities are no longer, uh, you know, sort of forgotten about, right? Like, you know, uh, as it may be with respect to uh, cybersecurity, we have been, you know, effectively fished mm -hmm. a few times in recent memory. Uh, you know, if you guys have town emails, you may have seen some things mm -hmm. uh, come through that are uh, seemingly bogus. That that does happen. It is a growing threat. So we're trying to introduce uh, $5,000 a year to implement a penetration testing program so we can work with a third party uh, vendor to sort of probe our network and identify our weaknesses, but also, you know, use those funds as each year moves to, you know, identify and develop and revise disaster recovery plans, uh, you know, perform different exercises that we need to, as well as, and, and I'll admit I am by no means a tech guru, and I think we have some in the room, but what's described as an endpoint detection and response protocol you know, I know that by, by sort of the industry leader, uh, CrowdStrike. Mm -hmm. So we would be looking to engage with a vendor like that that sort of provides a software package that is both that is adaptable and is being maintained to sort of respond to these growing and evolving threats that is happening quite rapidly that lives in your network at, you know, at each Endpoint so that the devices that are there with end users and they find things that, you know, what I'll call Easter eggs that get buried when someone was in there. And is often the case that, you know, what was left during a phishing attempt that, you know, sort of malware or ransomware will live there for some period of time long before it becomes active. So this is a software that's constantly crawling our network and our devices to look for those potential threats, but also has a response mechanism for sort of isolating them in a way. And then as well as uh, upgrading or what we'll call a GIS platform modernization. So many of you may be familiar with the software package we've used for a number of years called People GIS. Mm -hmm. uh, that is becoming a bit of an outdated platform. It no longer has the support that it used to. In fact, it was once a local company when we, you know, based in Arlington, but it has since been uh, sold and bought out. It serves a number of different departments for various different purposes. It no longer, frankly, meets our needs, but it no longer seems to meet 
the public needs as well. We make all those data layers publicly accessible on a website separate from the town, and people do a lot of modeling and spatial analysis and figure out how zoning changes might impact the town or different developments. So we're looking to switch over to what I know to be the industry standard, that is the Esri Arc GIS platform that is far more robust, has a number of different tools, allows for different analytics. And frankly, many of those things are built in. You, you get to benefit from how robust you know the Microsoft platform is, but also get to the advantage of tools that other people have sort of developed and it becomes part of the, the pool. So that assists us with asset management, work orders, you know, anything you can envision with uh, a GIS platform. It's something I could envision using to help document overnight parking requests and overnight like anything that you can envision spatially. This is something that uh, will benefit, you know, sort of the community at large, but also a number of town departments. In terms of personnel on the general fund side, the only proposed increase uh, this year is for one part-time circulation librarian uh, for roughly $18,000. And uh, the desired intent there, and this is, you know, based on a lot of things that, you know, I have heard over my years working here, but, you know, a desire to restore library hours and service levels to where they were back in 2003 when we uh, cut a number of staff leading up to that, and we started closing the library on Thursday mornings. So this one strategic investment would allow us to restore uh, Thursday morning hours at the Robbins Library. You know, we estimate that that'll serve about 200 people every Thursday that are uh, looking to get those library services. And you know, it's strategically placed on the circulation side of things. In the past four years, in aggregate, we've seen at least a 25% increase in circulation at our library. So not only that, we also introduced a sort of pretty robust library of things that involves anything from metal detectors to sewing machines and other complex items that frankly require a lot more uh, handling, inspection and training on the circulation side of things. So. This would sort of provide the, the additional staffing, but also through the week, the additional support we need in circulation. So a, a, a fairly small investment for actually a robust return on that investment in terms of increasing uh, service delivery. And then, you know, a couple other highlights I think listed here are street light repairs and replacements. So folks may recall, you know, a little over 10 years ago, we converted all our street lights to LEDs as part of the uh, Green Communities Program. Uh, though, and up until this point, when they failed, they had a 10-year warranty. We were able to call and get them replaced. So it didn't carry with it much of a cost for the town. We are now outside of our warranty window. So you will have to pay for the repairs and place replacements moving forward, unless and until, and I know we've discussed this via the capital plan about finding the right time to actually revamp all of the fixtures because even the LED technology um, has come along, especially with the dimming and lighting levels and poor appearance. But for now we are expecting in order to be able to keep up with those uh, replacements that we need to do that are no longer covered under warranty uh, to see increased cost there. And then finally, uh, field maintenance. That is another one of those things that we uh, bid out and competitively procure for uh, three year intervals. And again, those costs tend to uh, increase with each year. So many of you may know, like we have a parks division that does a lot of the mowing and striping, but this is with respect to uh, our turf treatment and protocol, like fertilization, aeration, overseeding, uh, slice seeding, grub treatments, you know, any number of sort of treatments that we put on all of our acres uh, of turf across the town. So if we could hit the next slide. So the, the next slide here, and I know this lived in the budget explainer, we don't have to go through, you know, each and every line, but these are in fact all of the increases, but all of, uh, or at least some of the decreases as well. So, 
we did reduce the town's posted budget by $20,000. Uh, we did reduce the IT budget by $7,000, and that's noticed in a telephone expense line. And that is, in fact, because there were some hard lines, I believe, related to the high school and some other buildings. So some copper that was no longer necessary. It was redundant, and we were able to cancel that service. And not shown here uh, is another approximately $3,000 software decrease as we begin to phase away from Informix, our old software for ICS, the prior water meter platform. We're sort of working on that transition. We have less of a commitment necessary uh, to that program. So we're able to reduce that line by, I think it was about $2,600. So, and then in addition to this, you know, the $270,000 in sort of new expenses, the remaining uh, portion of sort of the, the town ask where the town budget increases was set aside for the salary reserve. And that is because fiscal year 24 was the uh, year of expiration for each and every one of our collective bargaining agreements. So. Uh, fiscal 25, 26, and 27 is a new contract cycle for all of our unions. So as was customary in the past, we set aside money in advance of future settlement of those uh, collective bargaining agreements. And you know, what I'd say there is we tried to be as aggressive as possible in trying to set aside as much money as possible. And though it's not yet public, we are you know, sort of finalizing our uh, benchmark salary survey against the town manager 12 communities. Uh, Alex, remind me, our COLA pattern for the last three years was probably it was one and a half to two over the last three years. So, like, average is about 1.75. Yeah, 1.8%. And, and needless to say, I think we're finding as a result of that salary survey, given what has happened in other municipalities, but what has happened more generally with the high inflationary pressure over the past three years, that we have in fact lost ground uh, in certain areas of the market and with respect to certain positions. So, you know, we're happy to have set aside as much as we reasonably could have in hopes of uh, potentially providing uh, a stronger COLA pattern moving forward if we can. So with that, I would turn it over to Alex to <clears throat> speak to some of the uh, select board override commitments. Sorry. Well, okay. before we, we do that, let's, Ask some questions oh, sure, on sure. what you've covered so far. If that's okay. okay. Um, I'll start with two questions. Have the have police officers agreed to wear body cameras? Yes, it's the body worn camera policy itself that is yet to be agreed to and is set for arbitration. What's the difference they have? So there's agreement in principle to a body worn camera program. There's, it's already been bargained in terms of a percent of salary has been agreed to for the buff. It's the policy itself that governs their deployment and how they'll be used, when they'll be used, and the, those things. There's some language in there that there's you know some uh, issues to be resolved with, and we're set to hopefully resolve those this spring. And field maintenance, has there been any thought to increase user fees to offset the increased costs in field maintenance? Uh, so without getting into dollars and cents, yes. Uh, what we're finding is that it wasn't just field maintenance that has gone up. In fact, the our porta potty contract has gone up significantly as well. So the recreation department is reviewing exactly how much the user fees can go up. But in large part, if they were to go up, it would be dedicated to funding, uh, you know, the porta potties at all of the fields as well. Can I jump in real quick? Uh, one thing that we that we've uh, sort of done over the last couple of months is ask all of our department heads to review all of the fees that they charge at the department level for all kinds of different services that are offered. Uh, many of them have not been updated in quite a long time, and so we're just taking a holistic review townwide at all of our fees and we will um, be making some recommendations soon on fee changes. Um, and so we're in the middle of that process right now, um, but that is something that we're working on just as an FYI. Other questions, Annie, Rebecca, Charlie? 
Um, so I have two questions. The first one is um, your electricity costs. Is it our use of electricity that's going up or is it the cost of the kilowatt hour costs? It is the per kilowatt hour cost. So, you know, in December we were maybe eight cents and now we're at 12 cents mm -hmm. and that distribution has gone up as well. All right. So more than two and a half percent, more than three percent. Uh, and then contracted services, similarly, the, the, have, do we have any of the, you rattle off a bunch of them and drop every year, like the field maintenance contract or so forth. What on average is the increase that we get asked for, even if we're competitive and bid those out? Are we falling below 3% or are we getting 10%? I mean, what? It is oftentimes above 2%. Okay. Say so a lot of times it's around 5%. Okay. So, not within two and a half percent. Just checking. Thank you. I had a question about the ARPA drop in spending that you mentioned that went from about five million to about half a million. Mm -hmm. um, Annie and I are in charge of the health and human services budget, so I know we do still have ARPA offsets. Um, are those the 450,000 that is in there? Yes. Just, okay. Good. Yeah, so That's the drop like, was the. <laughs> with the five million dollars in general fund okay. revenue offset that was permitted by uh, Treasury, so that like that's the steep cliff, but the the staffing remains except for one ARPA position in HHS, which was no longer needed. That was a health compliance officer position, which is the the one difference between yeah. twenty four and twenty five. Perfect. Thank you very much. And just just so you know that that four hundred fifty thousand dollars is not tied to ARPA. That's right there. That is. Uh, an overlay reserve surplus that we're budgeting uh, to be used as a revenue source, which is sort of standard. It's an uh, annual thing. Um, this does not showcase all of our ARPA funding and where it sort of like is found throughout the organization. Okay. Charlie, then John, then Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have two questions. Uh, one year, a couple of years ago, when body cameras were first raised as a possibility uh, in the Arlington Police Department. There was considerable discussion at the Finance Committee and later at town meeting about the policies, not to do with the use of the cameras by the police, but how the data that was produced would be uh, protected. And, mm -hmm. you, you know, the example is, that was given by one of our members was that um, there can be all sorts of uh, private scenes recorded on these cameras that are not necessarily crime related or whatever and that needs some uh, privacy controls is there any policy about that that's been developed uh i shall be honest i don't have a good answer to that question for you this evening can we take a look at that i mean i, I don't need a response tomorrow but i think it's an important question yeah i th i think so it is is often the case with much of what's handled here at the police department is there's a desire to segregate that information and have it be managed by a very particular third party vendor that we do for much of what's collected here to limit sort of access to the outside world. And not just the outside world, like even within the organization and having it sort of live on a separate network. So that is fairly customary for what gets handled here. And I imagine the same is true, but I want to be able to speak more intelligently to exactly what the plan is to make sure that that's secure. Thank you. The second question is that uh, you mentioned that uh, we were finally getting rid of the Informix uh, software, which is great. It's only taken about 20 years. Not getting rid of it entirely, but almost. Okay, working towards it. Okay. Yeah. So um, we had a, a big investment in new meter readers, remote meter readers. And it seemed like my recollection from a prior year's discussion was that it could not be implemented because of this Informix system. Have we gotten over that uh, hump or is that still a problem? But I think the hump that we're still getting over is finishing the deployment of all of the new meters and readers. So we're still in the midst of that program. I think we still have maybe six or 700 uh, meters that we're still trying to get into households for. And you know, we experienced a pretty significant delay in that project with some supply chain issues. We just were not able to get as much of the products as we needed to, but that is underway. We're sort of sending second notices, final notices, but 
until we've completely re, you know, deployed the new product, we can't fully turn off the old product. So, so it's it's the availability of the meter readers that's keeping Informix as opposed to Informix preventing the meter readers from coming in? Yeah, that, that's my understanding. We have to get all of the new meters and meter readers installed before we can... Uh, this is a program that we started at least five years ago, if not longer, as I recall. I mean, I was on the capital planning committee when we acquired, uh, or at least allegedly funded the the new meters. So that in, you know, I'm noticing some bit of discrepancy here because a good portion of this project we are funding with ARPA dollars, which didn't come uh, until after five years ago. So, and I'd, I'd have to look at exactly what what may have been contemplated five years ago. Well, we had something. I know we had a multi hundred thousand dollar project yeah. to find and budgeted some time ago. Sure. Okay. In any event, uh, it would be nice if we got there. And at the time, we were looking at the possibility of labor saving as a result of this. What's the contemplated outcome now on that? Not sure. Labor savings with respect well, to. Well, we used to have people going around. You know, going down to the basements and reading meters, you know, and then mm -hmm. we had meters outside, so they come in. Now, I understand the new program is remote reader, meter reading, truck drives around, picks up the signal, records it. Um, mm -hmm. So that means a lot fewer people climbing up steps or going behind buildings, et cetera. What's going to yeah. happen with that personnel layer? So we've been doing remote reads like this now for a number of years, so that that wouldn't be a new and upcoming change. It's the way it is now that the meters go to a transmitter that lives on the side of your house, and then that transmitter signal to what's known as a collector device, which we have a handful of around town at sort of high points. So it's actually been you know some time now that we've been able to read most meters from afar. So I don't see there being a significant shift once this uh, phase of deployment completes. Then what, what's holding, what's keeping Informix? The fact that we still have some old technology out there. It, it's a much smaller extent, but we're essentially still running two systems. Thank you. John? <clears throat> yeah, sure. Um, my question relates to the over, override stabilization fund. It looks like it's, it's pretty high at the, at the end of FY24, it's up to 17.6 million, mm -hmm. which is, um, you know, a solid like maybe 10 million higher than, than we saw, at least on the version I'm looking at last year. So did that come in a lot higher than expected at the end of uh, FY24? Which which version are you looking at? Sorry. So the stable, so I'm looking at a version from last year. I think it's the final one. I apologize if it isn't, but it looks like here it says we're going to finish up the override stabilization fund with 7.9 million. And it seems like that turns to 17.6 million, which sounds like great news. Mm -hmm. uh, is that true? Like, am I generally accurate here? Yeah, what it says, I, I, it, I don't know what it says for 24, but I yeah. will tell you right now that that is in fact a live number. 17.6 million. Indeed. Yeah, and um, I guess, you know, again, I, I think I have the final version from last year, maybe I do, maybe I don't, but it seems like it's good news. It seems like it's higher than expected. And um, is is that you know somewhat of a windfall? And does that affect the long range plan in a good way? Uh, it affected it in a good way, in such that we didn't need an, an override in fiscal year twenty four. Okay. What I think we're seeing as a relic for that FY twenty four budget is that the override stabilization fund figure in that long range plan was was likely a sort of like static figure. Yeah. that had not been uh, getting shown the benefit of interest over time. Okay. But I'll tell you right now, that that particular account pulls in you know upwards of $120,000 a month in interest, given yeah. where rates are right now and where the principal balance is. So that is a figure as of today, and that is without even having reconciled some of those, you know, we're you know, usually four to six weeks behind reconciling all the various bank accounts. So that's what lives in what we call Munis or financial system today, but it 
continues to grow because we're not yet drawing down from it. Yep. So that's, that's, and, and if you go to the top, you know, the override stabilization fund that was utilized in FY24 seems like a pretty low number, 795 k mm -hmm. um, So it just seems like, you know, it gets good news. And I'm curious, you know, when you get to FY25, still, you know, basically the budget we're looking at next year, you know, you're almost down to zero on the stabilization fund. Um, is, is uh, you know, is, I guess my question is why is, you know, why is the stabilization fund down? Is, with all that good news, and I know I'm generalizing, you know, with that good news, why is the stabilization fund still down to 209K next year? The budget we'll be looking at next year, the FY25, FY26 budget, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There, there's like a number of ways to sort of explain this because there's yeah. so many different moving parts sure. in here. And um, so the first being, um, so our free cash usage is one thing that we need to key in here. We use a 10 year trailing average to calculate our usage of free cash in our out years. So, um, so we use that to forecast going forward. But in the last couple of years, we've had record high levels of free cash. So what we're projecting in our plan, our usage we know is going to be, so in FY26, we're showing $5.704 million in free cash. We are very likely to have a, a higher number than that in that category. So anything that we can contribute in that free cash line will drive our usage of override stabilization down. Additionally, we uh, are carrying, um, if you just look at FY25 in our local receipts line, uh, we're carrying $10.25 million there. Um, we estimate our revenues very conservatively with our local receipts uh, in anticipation of not screwing ourselves over. We don't want to end up uh, upside down on our receipt collection. Um, in last year, we came in at about $15 million in our local receipts to give you an idea, like the benchmark again. Yep. Um, all of that excess money closes to free cash. So there's a number of things that contribute to this. Um, Additionally, things that build into our free cash number, departmental turn back, so any money is appropriated but remains unspent, that goes back into our free cash number and then is appropriated into a future year, right? So with that being said, um, we're looking at a, you know, a, a large red number in FY27. Um, this plan, it compounds your issues over time. And so any sort of a, any sort of an issue is magnified each year it goes out. So um, that $17 million, if you're looking in your budget book, uh, deficit in FY27 is likely to be smaller than that based on the benefit of higher free cash numbers and turn backs, et cetera. Um, also, we're likely to have uh, marginally better um, new growth and other sort of like revenue numbers, which is very conservative. With so the point being that um, our, our override stabilization fund, we will likely not draw it down as quickly as we're showing on this plan, but um, we do have to plan for it just in case. Sure, sure. Yep, that makes sense. Thank you. So let's have the questions focused on departmental budgets, and then we'll talk about the long-range plan and the override. Right, we have a couple slides on that. And other things. Right now, let's just have the questions as to what we've covered so far. Um, Topher and then Sophie. <coughs> yeah, so... Um, Back to the forms. Um, you had said there was a three thousand dollar reduction. In it. Approximately twenty six hundred dollars. The IT department reported. Okay, because the IT budget here shows it budgeted at seven k in twenty FY twenty four and FY twenty five. Right. So, so it's one of those things that's not yet shown, but that oh. you know they recently reported to us yep. as okay. having right sized that number. Okay. Um, and the other thing I noticed in the pie chart is capital budget was eleven percent, mm -hmm. and I had always been under the impression that we set aside five percent. So can you explain? Sure. Um, right there. Yep. I mean, is that it? Is it? Is it? That excluded. Excluded. That includes debt. Yeah, the debt um, That includes excluded, excluded debt. debt that includes um, offsets as well. So okay. we um, we keep our five percent number. Um, that is a number that we like really won't move off of up or down work very well here. Um, and um, yeah, so we're, we're at 5%. Uh, the, there is a very intricate series of um, expenditures that we consider. And then there are also like a, a huge number of offsets that we consider. 
which allows us to zero in on a 5% number. And we can look at that capital budget more closely or I can send it to you, but it's actually in your it's budget. Right. Okay, no, I mean, the general gist I get it. Right. It includes more than just. Of just the five percent. Yes. Charlie, do you have? Yeah, comment just a that? comment on that, Alex. The, the five percent is on the uh, non-exempt budget. The reason that that number is higher is we have a exempt debt. significant exempt debt for right. from, from the high school, for example. Yes. Yeah. And that's what adds the two percent to that five percent. Right. Right. Sophie. Uh, Question or comment on the user fees that you were mentioning from the rec department that Park Point Ears has uh, use of services a lot of their children. Has the town looked, or are you also considering different fees for out of town um, people who use the services? I know, for example, on our system it says uh, resident fee, non resident fee. Mm -hmm. They've been the same for years, but I know other towns, like in Lexington, have made a difference between non residents. Um, and also whether there's a, a thought of allowing a priority for registration for residents before allowing non-residents to register. I know, for example, the tennis programs in the summer fill up. Um, a lot of town, a lot of times are on wait lists and with many non-residents using those programs. So something, I don't know if you have thought about that at all or. Uh, I have not, you know, I do know that we, in terms of the resident, non-resident or private versus sort of like public youth sports group. Uh, you know, I know taking like the high school field, for example, you know, I did at one point have a hand in managing that. And there, there were higher rates for outside entities. So I do think that precedent is there, but this isn't necessarily something I have uh, discussed with the recreation director. Happy to do so. But my understanding was always that we always fully intended to meet sort of our local needs first in terms of when we grant field permits and giving priority for time before we would start to give, uh, you know, sort of field time to outside users. So I would, I'd say it's not just field time as far as residents are concerned, it's also the classes that the mm -hmm. right program offers. Right. Thank you. Jones. The uh, cybersecurity increase, um, please tell me that includes some training. That's where the real security is, is teaching people not to click that link. Behind the keyboard, yeah, yeah, behind the keyboard, yeah. And five thousand doesn't seem like much. Yeah, and right, that that was just. What, that's a, that's five thousand in addition. I don't know what the total. Yeah, number that is. that's five thousand to do penetration testing and to to do outside activities. We are just awarded yet another grant from the state to do some internal cybersecurity training. They've set up a new platform that's going to be offered to municipalities. So this is going to be something we will be rolling out okay. to all employees to understand what's. With, with the newest risks are and how they appear and how they look just like something you'd get from Outlook and you know the various uh, forms they come in. So that that is pending and likely to occur before FY25 starts. That's something that I, I like. I beat every time we have a department meeting uh, like with our finance department divisions is you can talk to your people, make sure they're being aware of uh, phishing attacks. They're, they look legitimate. They look like they're coming from people within the organization all the time. Uh, if something looks a little out of place, pick up the phone and call someone um, to the help desk and don't touch any links. Uh, I think that like staying consistent is important also for all of us. And that's something we do at our department meeting all the time also. So it's something that we are focusing in on more, I think. Yeah. It's probably, and it's strange, just now at least once a week where I get a text message from someone like, hey, did you just email me? Right, once a week. I get them daily. I get right, like no, but like that it's coming in as my name and like, right. oh geez, yeah, right. just right. asking right. for something. Right. And my it's like, is that it's spending. Yeah, there's sufficient investment in training because that's really what's the most effective. Program. Yeah. All right. Uh, Overrides and nothing else. Yep. Okay. Um, the override commitment. So uh, as part of the recent override, the select board um, it makes certain commitments to the public before, you know, uh, sponsoring or um, approving of the ballot question. Um, this budget maintains all of those commitments, um, which financially they're three and a quarter percent uh, a growth cap um, on the town, uh, three and a half percent. 
growth for schools and their gen ed budgets and assistant average fed. Um, it maintains the commitments to uh, respond to enrollment pressures, um, both positive and negative. So the school's budget flexes up or down with the uh, addition or subtraction of students at the rate of 50% of um, DESE's per pupil funding number. Um, this you know, makes pretty significant commitment uh, investments in uh, our school department, um, some smaller investments in the town uh, to the tune of $600,000. This is for our, we've made additional com contributions to our OPEB liabilities, um, additional contributions to our uh, mobility, uh, so sidewalks and uh, roadways through capital, and uh, $250,000 investment into our sort of head off our, it's going to be a big problem, our solid waste and recycle. So we talked about this next year there. Um, uh, you know, some, some, this is separate from the budget, but um, so sort of as a promise was to you know, try to look after our seniors a little more. Um, so uh, moving the senior circuit tax breaker into place, um, adopting that program. So that will give uh, some tax relief to our seniors in town. Um, and a the bottom one is maintaining a 5% financial reserve. Uh, to me, that's a no brainer. This is our, my personal top priority is to keep our AAA bond rating here. It is very important that um, how we are viewing, how we are able to borrow money out in the market. So, uh, next slide, please. So, we alluded to a revenue shortfall. This came um, from the governor's budget being funded, uh, funding Chapter 70 state aid at a lower number than we had projected. Um, the, what is called the Student Opportunity Act increased funding for certain communities over a duration of time. Over the last two years, our own team saw pretty significant increases in our Chapter 78. We had projected that the um, that, that increase would remain high. We thought that a 5% revenue was uh, relatively conservative, but it came in at just under 1% creating the $650,000 shortfall that we talked about earlier. Um, so when you compound that over two years, uh, because you lose out on that new growth level, you're gonna grow off of in future years, it creates about a little over a million dollars in deficit in uh, FY26. If you go to the next slide, I doubt anyone will be able to see that unless you have a telescope, but you should be able to tell that- There's a red it, number at the bottom now. There's a red number at the bottom now, which used to be balanced to zero, right? Um, so this is the hole that we're uh, working to climb out of. Um, and so um, maybe next slide. Um, am I talking about these or you, Jim? Uh, you can feel free to run through them. As, you know, as Alex is alluding to, I, I did want to call out one thing that I realized we didn't mention, but we did get one bit of good news this year. And this, that was, you may have noticed that the Minuteman oh, yeah. uh, school budget Actually decreased. Which decreased. So I, I want to call out that, that you know there there was one bit of good news. I don't want it to be uh, all doom and gloom. That that did go down, and frankly, it's sort of a, a building off of that. That is due to their Chapter seventy eight going up. It was also higher than they expected in fiscal year twenty four, and that left them with a bit of a surplus for member communities. The member communities subsequently voted to take that surplus, and. Uh, tackle the outstanding debt to be financed for the building project. So there was a ban coming due that will not necessarily be bonded. And of course we excluded that debt here in Arlington. So we will not have to put anything else for the Minuteman school building project uh, on the tax rate recap. We won't have to raise it because it's gonna be getting funded with that, the surplus uh, chapter 78 from school year 24. So I just wanted to point out that there was that one shred of good news for uh, not only fiscal year 24, but 25. All right, so some places we're looking to um, to help climb out of our revenue challenge here with Chapter 70. Um, so local receipts, our ambulance revenue, you guys will likely recall last year there was a change in how our ambulance revenue um, was collected. And we have advanced life support, basic life support. Um, the long story short is that we now collect a lot more money 
into the general fund and not nearly as much into our ambulance revolving fund. Um, the benefit to that is that in FY23, we collected almost a million dollars. In FY24, we're tracking to land comfortably over a million dollars. Um, that's like through, I think, the November number, that 522,000 that we've collected already. Um, in our year to date, like in our FY25 budget, we're carrying just $500,000 as our number. So we feel that we can comfortably grow that um, a little bit. Um, that's something we're considering. Our overlay reserve surplus. Um, this is money that has been budgeted into the overlay for over the accumulation of years. Um, anything that is not granted in abatements or um, it doesn't go uncollected, then gets closed to, uh, it doesn't close to the general fund. It remains in the overlay as surplus. Um, that account has grown to about $3.1 million. Um, in order to access that money, the assessors have to do an analysis and verify what they believe their maximum liabilities are. And then they would then take a vote um, to allow the select board to uh, consider that with their budget. Um, so there's an official process there. Um, we are likely to be able to uh, grab some of that revenue. Um, so just to put that in perspective, like yeah. Alex, in the long range plan you have it, what had been shown was a decreasing or conservative overlay reserve surplus usage on the revenue side of the ledger. So for fiscal year 25, we had projected a $450,000 uh, usage, noting in you know, fiscal year 24 that it did 600,000. And historically it's been, or at least for the past few years, it's been in that between six and $700,000 range. So as shown currently in fiscal year 25, it's at 450,000. But again, that's something that the uh, Board of Ass Assessors is working on as Alex alluded to. Right, and then, um... New growth, um, we do know that we have some new um, projects coming online in FY25. Um, we are carrying a projection of $700,000 in new growth to our tax um, our tax levy, our property tax levy. Um, the last two years, we've been a little over 1.2 million in 23 and then almost 1.3 million in FY24. We're likely to crest over a million dollars in FY25, just with what we know is in the pipeline right now. Um, so we may be able to adjust upward a little bit there as well. Um, on the expenditure side of the ledger, um, there are a number of warrant articles that we are considering how we can creatively fund them with and stick them into an ARPA category to fund them. Um, so specifically, we're looking at work on the master plan um, the 250th celebration, and um, also some capital projects um, that we may be able to fund via ARPA. So we're looking at everything that we think that we can at this point. Um, we've, you know, been consulting peers on uh, what they've been doing, uh, how they have, you know, looked at funding things with ARPA, and so we're trying to get creative on how we can reduce the sort of cash expense to us and you know some grants. Okay, um, more questions? Yes, wait, sure. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, so we think we can increase the, uh, some of the local receipts on the revenue side. We think we can grab more of the overlay reserve than we had budgeted in 33, so we're gonna go back up a little bit. And we think we're safe on the new growth, despite the current slowdown in the real estate, just because what you know is in line? Yeah, part of it's what's already been 50% okay. captured. So we, we are already guaranteed the other 50%, think like the Myrac project. And so I guess the question I have then is, what's the trend line on those three categories? Do you think you can keep it up going forward? Because obviously we don't have this money this year, then we don't have the growth base for next year. So. Are we being appropriately conservative right. on our trend projection? Yeah, certainly with ambulance revenues, yes. Mm -hmm. This is just a function of our new model, right? And, right. you know, we're, as Alex said, like the, the year to date figure is actually quite a bit of a lag because we don't handle the billing directly. So much of it's getting processed through Armstrong. We don't know. But, you know, we're, we're not, I guess we're not expecting less ambulance rides. We're probably expecting more ambulance right. rides. So, you know, in terms of those 
you know, if you speak to just the those items that are sort of more economic, like that follow economic trends or that are more volatile, you know, we've, you know, even with permit revenue, though we're seeing different types of projects, mm -hmm. permit revenue is still sort of blowing estimates out of the water again. So we, we haven't seen, I don't think, exactly the slowdown that we thought we might see. So what kind of different projects are we seeing? I think we're not seeing, you know, we haven't seen quite as many single family home demolitions, but I would say is we're still seeing a number of projects. Like, so this is interest rates impacting mm -hmm. it. I think that impacts more so certain builders mm -hmm. who are gonna be facing the short-term impact of those mm -hmm. higher interest rates, but homeowners doing large projects, which we call, we categorize those as $200,000 or greater, mm -hmm. seeing the name, same number of those projects, even those projects growing in cost, $800,000 renovation, $600,000 renovations. And I think obviously those folks are impacted by those interest rates too, but if it's, if you're building your forever home and you see what's on the horizon, you're likely just to refinance it, you know, after a few years. So I think it's <laughs> deterred only a certain category of our builders who actually finance projects. We're, we're, oh, we're still, right. And we're still seeing a number that pay cash and they are still, uh, you know, still doing teardowns. We're still seeing some lot splits, you know, single families turning into two families. And we, we get new growth out of those large renovations. That's not normal. Cool. Yep. Okay. John? Thank you, Mr. Uh, <clears throat> so, Jim or Alex, um, Jim mentioned before that the uh, anticipated insurance rates are two to three percent higher than we have in the plan. And it's a 22 or $21 million budget. So that's another $415,000 annual shortfall. Uh, you didn't mention that in, I didn't hear you mention that in, in the numbers that you were just calculating on the year to year changes. That, that is captured in our budget. That the 8% number, which is over and above, is captured within our budget. In the five year plan. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. It's sort of, you know, that because it's grouped with pensions and because the insurance budget also has workman's comp and a number of other things, when you look at that line, its total growth shows us less than 8% because it's blended with those other categories, but it's just the health insurance premiums that are projected to go up by eight to 10%. And when we found that out, right, that was sort of like a, it was about a million dollar hit to our insurance budget. Now that was one of the times we sat down with the school department and one of the areas we identified to provide some relief was having the uh, after school programming staff and their insurance costs be borne uh, within the school department's budget. So, but that million dollar change is in the current budget, correct? Yeah, we knew about that before publishing okay, this plan. Yeah. We, we won't know, right, the final number until early March, and then we will react accordingly. Okay. Yeah, we, you know, they'll announce, you know, the GIC in early March will announce the rates for the various plans. And then we have to go through and pair up what those plans are versus which the plans are that are held by our employees. And some will go up a little bit more than others. And that's when we can finally hone in on what the actual figure is. Josh? Yeah, thank you. Um, I don't know if it's relevant or not, but uh, one of us went to a seminar by the um, National Municipal Association, and they had a seminar on rebuilding their municipal buildings in Lexington. And they said that they actually could sell the projects uh, on dollar terms because they had, were built at, at like a, whatever the peak rate that they used per day and determined their whole rate. And so that by installing batteries, they kind of diminish that load. Uh, I don't know if our utility bills done like that on your, your contract. Is it fluctuate based on peak demand? At certain sites, yes. At large consumption sites, yes, they would be demand charges. So, so not at every facility. Right. Some. So in Lexington, they said they could, they were selling kind of becoming green, which it actually greatly reduced like 40% maybe reduction in their cost. So I don't know if that's anything that we're aware of here. You're implying like the use of battery storage systems? Yeah, because they could have a battery, so they're rather yeah. than the, the <clears throat> peak demand rather than drawing off the grid. 
mm -hmm. off the battery and thereby lower their peak demand, which then, right. but that little 15 minute increment would raise the price for the whole day, let's say. Yeah. And so by having that on battery, then they saved a lot of money. Yeah, I know that was something we had contemplated for a portion of the Arlington High School building project, but for whatever reason, it didn't pan out. They're doing all their build, all their, they're yeah. retrofitting all the buildings like this, the same model. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah. yeah. Right now, the only thing we've recently started participating in is we do what's called a load shedding. So we belong to a group that you get the sort of an urgent notice from the, the IS1, sort of the grid saying, we expect this to be a peak demand day. And if we proactively engage in load shedding, and it's oftentimes during the summer, and our biggest energy users are the school buildings, so you might pre-cool them the evening before, and then we have to agree to set the air conditioning at a much higher temperature, and mm -hmm. our participation in that program has netted us at certain buildings, you know, it's usually around like $10,000 a year for our participation at each site, because we do our part to I guess, reduce stress on the grid at those mm -hmm. sort of potential brownout or blackout times. John, did you have your hand up? Um, no, I'm going to save my question. I think it's going to be more relevant on the next slide. Any other questions? Um, all right, no more slides. So what's your question? <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering what I was going to say. I thought I heard something about it slide on the schools. So my question relates to um, the override and actually some of these uh, these you know new charges that that you know weren't anticipated for instance the insurance and then maybe the drop in the state aid. Is there any discussion of um, funding the new programs net of, of, of like for instance the increase to the insurance and net of the decrease to the state funding? In other words you take the seven million instead of just saying here's the seven million and we intended to use it is the seven million less some of these unforeseen charges? Uh, because I know that you know on the ballot it was mere, it was merely you know pretty straightforward seven million dollar operating override. It wasn't you know fun you know for this funding or for that funding. So just to avoid a future at least prolong a future override, is there any discussions of um, you know taking some of you know taking some of these hits to that seven million dollars? So what I would say is, you know, I, I don't think we've yet had that firm discussion, given that this is still fairly new news. And our first reaction was, okay, let's take a, you know, as close a look as we can at everything that we already have within our grasp and see where that gets us. But, you know, we haven't modeled this yet to know exactly how far we've gotten yeah. and that what now we may need to revisit both on either the town or the school side. So I think that those discussions are forthcoming. Yep. And I'd be naive to sit here and say that we have a, that we've ironed out a, a plan to sort of claw ourselves out, but we didn't sort of think about it on that macro level quite yet because, sure. you know, we sort of also sent everyone's budget numbers to them yeah. and then got the news after the fact, you know, yeah, had, no. hey, had it happened another way, I, I think that that probably would have been sort of the, an appropriate logic model to apply, but. Yeah, no, I, for some reason, I just, I, I, I don't like the fact that, you know, $7 million is already spent. You know, I feel like there should be a little bit of flexibility with that $7 million, but mm -hmm. you know, I actually watched the select group meeting when they did approve the override and they did consider the, uh, you know, these new programs. And of course, the, you know, they did say they like the new programs, um, but only the, you know, the $7 million operating override is what made it to the ballot. And that's probably, I think, what most of the, you know, voters consider this as an operating override. So in other words, a lot more flexibility with how it's spent. And maybe one other thing I did hear in the discussion from the select considered it, of course I'll refer to them, is that you know they don't want overrides to be true. So I know that's a macro huge discussion, but the impression I got was that they, they do not want overrides every three, three, four years. So okay, how do you avoid that? I would mm -hmm. think you take another look at that seven million dollars. Yeah, and I, I, I wouldn't want to speak for them or sure. pretend to know exactly no, how they feel about the, yeah. the timing or frequency of the overrides. Got it. Charlie. So, um, with respect to John's comments, <clears throat> um, number one, I think the DOR only allows you to put um, a number 
on, on the ballot. You can't put any details on it. So that sort of constrains the select board putting up a number. I thought you could, I thought you could actually say, you know, we want to be fired. That's a, that's, yeah. a, that's a dead exclusion. That's a different thing okay. than an override. Yeah. Um, secondly, uh, my understanding is that the DOR has previously ruled that if, if a select board or a municipal uh, council or whatever says that um, they're going to do certain things with this override money, the community is bound to follow that commitment for the first year. Right. And then after that, it, there can be adjustments. But the first year that that made to the, to the, that commitment is made to the voters, it's, it has to be followed. So I want, I want to only because I don't I don't think the select can appropriate money. So no 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 uh, it's yeah. not it's it's what it is what the DOR said is if the municipal management makes commitments for X Y and Z for an override yeah those commitments have to be met in the first year second year beyond yeah. is sort of up for grabs I'm right but not, not yeah the first I, I might take a look at that. Myself only because I actually read it. It's very confusing. I I think that might be the situation where there's more detail on the ballot. In other words, when the ballot says we're gonna we're gonna take the seven million dollars and buy a fire truck, which that's, is what, outside that's of that's not an override. Right. It's not an override. What is that? It's, it's, that is exclusion. it's a capital item provision. A different, a different, a different matter. All right. Thank you. Telfer. Yeah, just on Wagner's plan. A couple questions. Um, I noticed on line I, this court judgment Sims, is, is that vestigial at this point? We heard much about the Sims. Yeah, it's sort of a, like a, a ghost relic that mm -hmm. lived there. Um, and, okay, and then the uh, municipal budget, the mission, mission, yeah. municipal building insurance trust fund, as I understand it, that's, you have insurance on the buildings, if the buildings are down, you have a deductible, mm -hmm. and this is what that's for. That's okay. invested in growing right slightly. Okay. Yeah. And at times it would provide relief if you need to take immediate action before you would get oh, if you have okay. bills to pay before you basically pay. for the insurance company. Yeah. Other questions? Oh. Um you mentioned the changes to the ambulance fees. Does the ambulance revolving fund still have a purpose or is it going away? It does have a purpose. It is not as great as it once was um, because we do still collect some ALS revenue and we still book it into the revolving fund. Um, and so that still does get some treatment on the capital plan as an offset, although it's just not as much as it once was. Um, so we could look at collecting all of our ambulance revenue into the general fund. It's not a very significant amount that's in the revolving fund. Uh, it's something that we eat a Jim, myself, we've been kind of thinking about what to do with it because it has changed significantly. I love to simplify stuff. So. Right. Yeah. But right. you've noticed like the, the offset has gone down over the last two years and at the end of this year. It's okay. What's the balance left? Is it time to just move on from it? Right. Other questions for the town manager? Anyone have other questions? Actually, mm -hmm. I do. Okay. Al and then Carolyn. Thank you. Um, so um, Water Bodies is interested, what is the tax that we pay to Lexington for Great Meadows? And I know you don't, you're not going to know this off the top of your head, but it's, but we, since we I pay a tax for Great Meadows. Meadows. It's on property. It's on property, but we don't, we pay a certain amount of tax to them because they're managing parts the of Great it. Great Meadows or? Fund and DPW or something? Uh, that sounds entirely foreign to me. Okay, so maybe oh, we'll look into it. I, okay. I, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Scoured this budget and I didn't see that expense anywhere. <laughs> and maybe it doesn't so maybe we're getting a bill. I don't so know. Maybe, if we're paying. Okay. So maybe there is. Okay. So maybe, never mind. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I was just going to ask if there was any financial benefit to having the governor living in town. <laughs> Where's the cost? We kind of wish there was more. I'll let you know after all our grant applications are reviewed. Delaware Manning is better police protection. Yeah. Maybe. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So good to go. <laughs> grant. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam. 
Um, so um, there's a um, to determine the uh, offsets in the water and sewer budget. There's a um, and how it's applied. Uh, there was a study done a while ago, and uh, so in the past, um, town managers have committed to having a new study done. Um, but those town managers aren't here. So what do you guys think about having a new study, making a commitment to having a new study done? I would ask for what would be the desired outcome or what would be the intention of doing that study? And, and I'm just curious what you think the outcome might be. Well, it was done five years ago. Mm -hmm. And other town managers have agreed to uh, redo it, perhaps to update it. Mm -hmm. um, is there any reason why it shouldn't be updated? No, I was just curious. I didn't know if, if you're implying that perhaps the offsets were high or low, or if simply that we thought they may needed to be sort of ground truth. Um, it's uh, verification or something that, you know, or maybe not. I mean, if, if we don't think they need to be done, but it's like, you know, it's, things change. So, um, and other town managers have thought they change. Not that you mm -hmm. have to abide by them, but they thought it should be done. Yeah, I mean, I think first what I would commit to is, you know, personally understanding them a little bit better myself, but also, you know, as I understand it, I think all the departments that it applies to are still perfectly relevant. The, the way the program was established is still valid, that there may be perhaps tweaks, as you know, like things may change over time in terms of like an IT level of effort versus the treasurer's level of effort. You know, ultimately, I would think it's probably a zero sum game, but that there may be, you know, shifts from sort of one department to another slightly in terms of the level of effort. I don't understand why there'd be a shift. There, there's a rate that says it's the amount of hours mm -hmm. that they spend working on water and sewer activities. Yeah. I don't know why they shift. They might go down, the amount of time might go down, and they might go up. Legal time legal spends on it, they might go up. But again, it's up to you. I don't want to take up a lot of time. Mm -hmm. I just want to put forth and ask if you want to do a commitment to it. Other town managers have thought that it might be done, but yeah. never followed through. There, there may be a transparency issue here. So, yeah, like um, I, I looked into this a little bit. We spoke a little bit earlier, and uh, there are, the, the DLS provides um, a suite of financial policies um, that communities can, can utilize. And when I was the finance director in the town of Hamilton, we did a community compact project um, um, around these financial policies. And one of them is indirect cost allocation, which is the, sort of the same thing as offsets. And so um, I took a look at that this afternoon a little more closely and the DLS provides for four sort of different ways to calculate your water and sewer offsets. And um, the way that we do it here is one of those four ways. Um, we should always be looking at everything um, and you know, looking at the level of effort is important and I think it's worth you know, looking at every year. So, um, you know, happy to keep looking at that. Oh, John? Well, thank you. Related to that, many generations ago, DLS wrote a report with a number of recommendations on it. And I believe one of them was to basically take water and sewer offsets out of the individual budgets, aggregate them for the town and have one big offset, but not allocate them across departments. And therefore, you'd have, you know, an actual department cost mm -hmm. without applying offsets to it. I'll, I'll, See if I can find that report. Mm -hmm. Come up with that. But, yeah. Be you know, do, you think that's, do you think that's better, though, in terms of for us to figure out? Well, how certainly, much time it's certainly is simpler. But it's fine. simply sim it is simpler. But if, if we wanted to know how much legal the department is really doing for water and soil, yeah. that's we, the we still have that number, but it's just a matter of, of how you structure the Budgets where whether money comes in as a lump sum that something's derived from timesheets. 
or whether it comes in each department. I'll, I'll dig up the report and find out, but that was the DLS recommendation, if I recall correctly. So maybe, you know, it, it doesn't become a budget issue, it becomes a timesheet issue. Well, right, that might just be another, so it's another it's, one of those it's methods. It's actual, not projected. It's another one of the methods. Right. But, but my point is more that, um, well, as a, for instance, the uh, legal department spends, uh, what, like 20%, maybe one out of every five hours working on water and sewer. 12 years ago, that was determined, or however long mm -hmm. ago that was determined. Maybe they spend more time on it. Mm -hmm. Right. Understood. Yeah, and I think don't, and don't we want to know? Or maybe they spend less. Right. And and it doesn't net out. That's what I don't under, I don't understand that. It doesn't net out. If the lawyers do less work, it doesn't mean that postage does more. So I don't understand that so much. It doesn't have to see how it nets out. I think I was thinking about a different circumstance. We talked earlier about we had run an older outdated software that perhaps required a significant amount of IT support. To run, but then you then you switch software and it requires less IT support, but then is being managed entirely by someone in the treasurer's office, right? Like the, the level of effort sort of was just shifting in a way. But I, I understand what you're saying that someone could be doing, in fact, more or less some 10 years later. And it doesn't net out to 100, it's a percentage of the budgets. Yeah, of, of those particular and, individuals. So I think it's sort of a transparent thing because, you know, that it goes up every year. Mm -hmm. And so does the so is the budget. So if they're working yeah. less, it's it just doesn't, uh, it, it may not be as equitable as if a new study was done. Right. And, and I think from the transparency perspective, right, if, if you look at some of the offsets in the budget, if you looked at CDBG or other things, right, it is tied specifically to an individual and you can see exactly what percentage of that individual salary it's funding. So you reach the conclusion that you need that much that person's time. But for water and sewer, as it is currently, right? Like it, it lives at the departmental level. It isn't necessarily tied to particular individuals within that department. So I can see how it doesn't provide the level of clarity that may be observable with other offsets in the budget. So I think that's another point. Any other questions for the town manager, Annie? Just, just one more since we're on to generic questions. So when you think about um, when you're planning for the operational future of the town, are you thinking in terms of, you know, we, we as a finance committee tend to be a little paranoid about adding positions, but sometimes it's not about adding, it's about you get some turnover, can we switch out, can we add a position here and take this one away because it's now not uh, modern anymore, so on and so forth. Are you... Mm -hmm. Do you look over the whole budget and sort of look for those opportunities? Are you looking for places where you know we need to add a service because it's 2024? And are there things that are in other job descriptions where maybe those job descriptions don't need to be doing those functions anyway? Am I making any sense? Yeah, I think so. And I think what I would say is that happens with really every vacancy. Mm -hmm. You know, I spend time reviewing job descriptions really every week and then sort of making modern, you know, modern edits to them so that before we post them, it reflects what we're actually looking for. So I think we take that opportunity every time we have a vacancy, whether it's a union position or not, to really look hard at what it's going to take. And I think there are probably some examples I could use, but I can see in the future as well, you know, oftentimes seeking the opportunity to perhaps combined positions or, you know, I, I personally am not one, I'm not gonna sit here and say like, you know, perhaps because I've worked here for a really long time. I know that I, we are not in a position where I can have, you know, sort of grand plans and come and say, you know, I need to add sort of, you know, five general fund positions or this or that. Like, so I, I wouldn't say I, I'm thinking about it uh, that way, but I think we try to look for every opportunity to like, okay, you know, how is the structure working? Uh, you know, how is that work chart flowing? We, you know, where are we struggling to hire? Where are we not struggling to hire? Okay, what are we doing well there? And what are we not doing well there? Like why are, you know, why do we have more vacancies at this level than another level? So I think those are- What can we stop doing in order to be able to start doing something? Yeah. That's fair. Carolyn. Um, you can see a lot of that happening in the class each year. 
Yes. <clears throat> so we, we see some of that <clears throat> record. And in my conversations with Karen, it's clear that she's looking at that when the time comes. Um, sometimes when she's just looking at each department and the HR within the department, and sometimes when people come to her and say, this isn't the job I'm doing. Can we change my title as to something that reflects on job? Someone who comes from the employee, but she's also doing that as well. And sometimes it's as simple as a title change. Right. To, yes. to modernize right. mm -hmm. what the position right. is. So when it's posted, right. someone's like, oh, I know what that means. I you know mm -hmm. what's a typist? Yeah, exactly. The yeah. phrase yeah. work typist from the budget. Yeah. We just like saying we're wiping them all out. I'm, I'm actively Please. working on it. We end this discussion off today. Yeah. They like all these different ways of saying, like, is it a project manager? Let's call it a project manager. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions anyone has for the town manager? Dave, Sophie, any particular questions? No, we just have the town manager's budget to present. <laughs> so you're all set with the question. Want to stick around? <laughs> okay. Oh, are we all set? All set? Um, I just want any more questions for the town manager. Are the deputy, are we all set? All right, well, thank you all right, thank for you. coming and giving, you, giving us your presentation. Um, let's do minutes before we finish your budgets and then go to the next Rebecca and Thanks. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. We're in a hurry to do this, don't okay. you? Go go down the cake later. Is that? <laughs> I think I'll be an hour. New chairs for this uh, meeting room. Is that uh, in the police budget or is that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in the capital budget. Oh, right. Green yeah. They last closed the two years. Second worst chair. Oh, 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 these are the second worst. Actually, the first worst of the first pattern. Oh, yeah, so, okay. <laughs> I have a little bit of question. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever been to the old Huntington Theater in Boston. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Yes, oh, yeah. yes. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, no, it's the like there's the there's like the like the the like the 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 all right, any um, provisions, changes, minutes? Yeah, um, I hadn't put the finance committee as a new like heading, so that's in there now. It was underneath scheduling the vote, but now it's its own section. Anything else, any other provisions, changes? Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. 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 All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Yeah. Budgets. Are uh, we ready to present the manager's budget? If you notice them um, in the uh, longevity column 51 56, I'm sorry, 28 49. In the uh, 50, 51 56 longevity, we notice there's an increase. And that is because um, 
the new deputy town manager for operations. That was a transfer from another position in the uh, health, to the director of health. So her longevity goes with it. Um, out of state travel um, stays the same, description stays the same, consulting, website support. There, there are no, are no dangers. Well, you did ask on printing of town reports, uh, the actual for 2023 was very high compared to what the budget for 24 and 25 is. And they don't want to increase that. The goal is to just print fewer books and reports. Um, they say, you know, closets full of old books. Mm -hmm. um, so that they're trying to be better about that. So, they, so even though the actual in 2023 was high, that's not their goal. Uh, and the, the 2023 actual on uh, otherwise unclassified was new desk furniture for the purchasing officer, um, there was a departure for the long-term employee, so everything was very outdated and old. So that was a, a bunch of new furniture that explained that actual, so that's not carried over in the budgets. Um, there's still no 71 type thing. So, um, I'd like to uh, make a motion to accept the, the manager's budget uh, as written in the book for 1,049,611. Second. Any questions? Wait, we, I, don't we, we usually vote the number after the offsets. So uh, I, can't, I can't hear you. We usually vote the number after the offsets, which would be 734671. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm due to have a cataract operation in the next <laughs> Okay, going back, so, so it would be at 734,671. Second. Any other questions? All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That's unanimous. And that concludes our. Uh, but it's, it's Thank like, you very uh, much. Good sure. job. Yeah. Good yeah. job. Yeah. All, All right. right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Rebecca. We have nine questions. Great. Um, so we're going to do libraries, rec, and read. Rebecca's going to leave. I'll if it says required. Andy, can you speak for a while? Um, we're going to do the libraries and then rec and read. Rebecca So unfortunately, the town manager stole my thunder that we have the old <laughs> new position. Um, so if we start with the library budget, which you can find on 134, um, we turn to the salary detail page. Um, you and you look all the way at the bottom that's currently vacant. There is a new position of library assistant for 17 and a half hours per week. And as the town manager referenced, this is going to help them open on Thursday mornings. Um, when Annie and I met with uh, the library director, Anna Litton, she was very excited about that. She said, um, there's always people waiting outside on the porch who've forgotten that the library is yep. not open Thursday mornings. <laughs> Uh, 9 30. 9 30. Yeah. Oh, no, not until one. That's right. Yeah. Um, so they are very excited about that. Um, she said that that was their, um, their largest priority. Um, other things you might notice in the salary details. Um, so, of course, we'd always like if a new person joins the position, we'd love to pay them less. And so if you look at Branch Library and about three quarters of the way down, that's an example where the new person that actually does receive less than the old. However, this is balanced out um, in some other positions. Unfortunately, you see the opposite. So for example, for the new head of circulation, 
we asked Anna why the new head of circulation is make so much more money. Um, and she said that in order to fill that position, they're finding in the library that sometimes in order to fill positions, they are having to offer higher salaries. So for example, that person came from Framingham State University and was already receiving a higher salary. So there's both things happening in this budget of the new people getting a little bit more or a little bit less. Um, she said, looking to the future, not, not reflected of course in this budget, but since they've added Thursday mornings back, um, the next thing they really feel that they're short on is staffing for children and youth services. So they're not meeting the expectations of, you know, library advisory organizations. Um, so in the future, that may be something that they would like to ask the town manager about. Um, oh yeah, and so, so this is a position where they believe they have the demand to need additional um, youth services and children's library capacity. This is a position that we've heard about three years in a row. So three years in a row, they've been told they can't add this position. And I would just like to point this out apropos of our discussion about holding vacancies from, I mean, uh, it's not necessarily a one for one, but sometimes that's the effect. End of editorial. Thank you. Um, so back to the main page on library salaries. Um, Topher, you had had a question about what the stipends were. Um, those are just part of the union contract. Some of the union employees just get a $200 stipend that is called training. And that's just mm -hmm. part of their negotiated contract. Um, clothing works exactly the same way. It's yeah. just certain employees receive that as part of their um, contract. Um, if you look at all of the other elements, we are not seeing any change with the exception of the books and materials. So this reflects this $7,500 increase reflects um, additional spending for digital services. So right now, two places in the budget, you see money that we give to the Minuteman Library Consortium. So that shows up under other contracted services. Five two three six. That is a subscription service for the Minuteman Trust to just belong to the Minuteman um, Consortium. But then also within books and materials, that's where we pay for the digital materials. So if you want to download a library book to your Kindle, um, we pay for that through the books and materials. Uh, and they're asking for an additional seventy five hundred dollars to support those digital materials. She did say Arlington is the largest consumer within the Minuteman group. So we mm -hmm. can spread out that. Um, the total amount we do spend between the other contracted services and the books and materials, the total payment we make to Minuteman every year is 155000 Like again. Um, one of the things Annie and I asked about was, even though know, the budget is only 33500 for maintenance, 5202 maintenance. Their actuals were higher than that. So we were a little concerned with the budget sufficient to meet their needs, but she's not worried about that. She said some of that work is being done through the facilities. Um, so she thinks that that double the amount will be sufficient. Um, another thing to note at the bottom is the box offsets are listed at $30,000. That's from the little resale shop inside the box. Um, uh, but not appearing on this, but if you'd like more details, you can see in the SharePoint for the library section, there is a nice pie chart that tells you the additional money that comes into the libraries um, that's through the Friends of the Library, the Arlington Library Foundation, State Aid, Fox Shop. Um, essentially, the budget you see here of about $2.8 is 500,000 less than their actual spending. So they get about 500,000 from outside sources, um, which again, if you want the actual breakdown, it's available on the SharePoint. Um, so of the non-salary spending, half of it comes from the town and half of it comes from its outside sources. Uh, there's about $9 million in their funds, but they're not all yeah, that does not mean they are available to be spent. 
Uh, what else can I tell you? The last thing she mentioned was, um, again, going forward, not reflected on this budget, but something to think about is the, uh, the library is hoping to rebuild the Fox branch. And so in order to raise money for that, the Arlington Library Foundation is hoping to hire a part-time fundraiser that will be paid for by donations. So they'll use some of the donations to hire the person who will then lead a fundraising capital campaign. And they'll take the money from the capital campaign and some money from the state to hopefully rebuild the box. Future, something to keep your eye out for. Any other things on libraries? I think those those were the highlights. Um, I mean, one of the things that I really appreciate about this budget is that you know they are doing their best to leverage private outside funds, donations, so on and so forth. Um, and you know, it is true that those funds can only be used for non-salary uh, expenses. So those funds make a huge difference to the amount of books and materials the library has to circulate. Uh, and very much support what's available to the public. Um, and then I think, you know, Rebecca and I were equally excited about the re restoration of those hours in 2004 when we had one of the worst budget cuts we ever had from the state. Um, we reduced library hours by a lot more than that and have slowly kind of worked them back. Uh, and so it's been really great. And then just to remember that we have an obligation to spend a certain amount of our municipal budget on the libraries in order to maintain our uh, membership in the Minuteman network. It's like a state law or requirement or whatever. And so we can't fall below that. If we fall below it, we need a waiver to continue to maintain our relationships with other libraries. And being able to lend back and forth through the Minuteman network is a huge part of what makes our library attractive to the many people who live in town who, for example, are students at local universities, so on and so So it's kind of an overview of how that kind of fits into our town as a cultural uh, asset. Oh, do you have a motion? I do. I would like to move um, approval of the library budget in the amount of $2,822,379. Second. Questions? Grants, Peggy, Al, Topher. Go ahead, Grant. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I think the Minutemen, well, I love libraries anyways, and I think the Minutemen Network is fantastic. I mean, that really makes it the fact that you can borrow a book from anywhere. It shows up at the library, and they delivered it during the pandemic, and it was great. When you mentioned there's a, I hadn't been aware of this minimum or the threshold. And again, just this curiosity factor. Um, what is that threshold? Is it like we write at it or is it? No, no, we, we are in good shape right now. I, I, I'm probably scarred for life by the early 2000s when for several years we were below it and we had to get a waiver because of severe cuts we had to make all over town. It wasn't just libraries, it was everywhere. It was a big, big drop in state aid, which was based on the, there was a recession here in 2000. Um, What's the question? It's, it's, it's mostly our materials funding. We have a, the town has to fund our books and materials line to a certain extent, and the overall library budget to a certain extent. It's part of why we haven't moved all of facilities maintenance to from the library to facilities because we have this. I don't know what the exact threshold is. I know we're safe at the moment. Okay, okay. it's just a a thing to keep in mind. Should we fall upon very hard times? When we're looking at this budget, there's a big risk to making deep cuts here. Um, and that's the big risk. I appreciate the special effect. Probably more than you wanted to. Yeah, I don't like that. If you don't know, you don't know. That's mm -hmm. good. Peggy. Actually, I have the exact same question. <laughs> yeah, so thank you. All right, I'll, I'll see what I can find out about oh, this. Same, same answer. Two questions. The, the <laughs> Friends of the Robbins Library is sort of like the Fox thing. Is, is there, is, and I know they, they seem, I think they raise a fair amount of money with the bookstore sales and things like that. Why isn't that listed as a offset? So it's, it, they, it's off budget. That's right. So it's it's part of this 500000 that just doesn't appear in the budget at all. <laughs> so 
I will hand you the piece of paper. Okay, but the let me ask this give them why, why, why is the Fox hours. Library offset in there then? What's I, the difference? Why are they treating it differently? Well, that's not friends, that's just store, right? Yeah, I don't yeah. know why that one's. Well, it's run on the Yeah, that's I'm a question. Just, I don't know. Okay. Maybe so, but so, 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 do you, do you know how much the friends? Yeah, so the friends give forty-two thousand seven hundred thirty-nine. Okay. Uh, don't. Great. So those books persist. Um, second question: the, the manager mentioned the Library of Things, which I think is a great idea. But um, do you see what the future is, and is that a good or a bad thing for the operations of the library? Is it a real distraction for staff, or you know? Well, we, comments on that? It. Yeah, we didn't discuss we it. We didn't discuss it this year. The first year that I did library, so I did talk about the library of things. And it, it is actually kind of really important to, I mean, it's it's very popular. Yeah, so also, I mean, what's the circulation of the things? I don't know, but I know that it's very popular. I mean, I have to go back in the annals of time two years ago to try to remember. Um, it's very popular, and I think that part of the reason that they continue to grow and maintain it is because there is demand. So one of the things that's a consistent theme in talking to the library director is that she's concentrating on where the demand is to expand services or materials or whatever. She's paying very much attention to what is and is not circulating, and they shift their investments based on that. Hence, more money going into digital than, say, CDs, which we don't, we don't, you know, purchase anymore at all. Right. So, um, uh, it's in the sense that it's responding to direct demand from the citizens of Arlington and its users. Uh, it's sort of like this perfect government entity, right? Yeah. It's, it's so direct. There's no question about whether the citizens really want that service or whatever. They do. Yeah. And in theory, it's a great thing, but it takes up yeah. a lot of room and probably a lot of staff time. Just, you know, yeah. It's but, reassuring that it's quiet. Yeah. No. I, and I, I don't think, just over the three years of doing this budget, I don't think they would continue to do something that they didn't think was both successful and efficient. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Because that's sort of the theme that runs through our conversations with them. They're concentrating on where's the demand and how do we need it, not mm -hmm. on doing something for the sake of doing it. Right. Thank you. So for Charlie, did you need to do that? Go for yeah. Silver first. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so you mentioned Fox Branch and the rebuild one. But um, are they doing that entirely through a capital campaign? No. Just, okay. I know they're surveying people on what they want to see, yes. and I didn't see anything in the capital budget, at least on the libraries or facilities, of yeah. money for it. So. Yeah, I I don't think they believe they could do the whole thing with a capital campaign, but I think that they do believe that it's not going to happen without some kind of capital campaign. Well, where's um, the rest of the money going to come from? Uh, well, I, it, I, I mean, I don't know what's in the capital plan, but I would assume that they will either be applying to the capital plan and waiting until it can get on it, or right. that they will be looking for our state funding or, state funding or whatever. Or yeah. Their state funding is similar to how their state funding for schools. It doesn't, yeah. you know, it doesn't build a school, but it does. Put so, it down. They'll probably have to do all of the above. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. That was my understanding, but I don't know the balance. You know, yeah. How much. Oh. And. It's it's typical for public libraries that they do a capital campaign when they're going to do an expansion or you don't like that. It's not it's not weird. It's not just that. No, no, it was more just yeah. how much of it is. Actually, that was a question. Charlie, did you have any hand up? Did Madam Chair, but I think Danny answered my question. I was concerned about our prior risk of losing accreditation, but I think that's what she was talking about. So I'm, oh, I'm done. Yeah. That's yeah. Exactly. Alan? So I and one of the things they're thinking about with the Fox Library is building apartments above it, mm -hmm. which I'm for. So does that mean a, the town would own all of that or a contractor? We did not discuss that. My okay. understanding from other meetings, it is very complicated and not right. settled yet, but it did okay. not come up in our conversation okay. because again, it doesn't appear in the budget, yeah, but yeah, they're right. just thinking. That involves right. a lot more than just the library department. Right, obviously. And, yeah. and obviously, yeah. it's a, this question of public private partnership, and it's just like dropping the law all the way. Right, so yeah, no, that's fine. I just throw it out there. 
any other questions on library? So just a, I'm just curious. Mm -hmm. There was a few years ago we did away with um, late fees or something like mm -hmm. that. Is that is there any follow up on is that working and getting books back or is there all a thought of? I'm just curious. Huh. It did not come up. It did not come up. Okay. I, I assume that it would have come up if it was having a financial impact, either lost materials or lost earnings. Didn't those go to the general fund and not the library? It's possible. That was always my understanding. <laughs> Easy to go through. Any other questions on library? So I believe there's a motion that's been seconded. Um, all right, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous. What's next? Okay, we'll do oh, the recreation department. Just on page 185. Actually, you know what? Um, why don't we start with Ed Burns Arena, if that's all right? On 181, which is um, just for people who are new to the idea of the Enterprise Fund, um, a number that you're going to see a very large amount of spending and a very large amount of revenue in here. So the Enterprise Funds are different from other things. Exactly. Are different from other things that we buy um, in the budget. All right, so Annie and I met with Joe Connolly. We talked about both breath and the rank. Um, if you, let's see, the highlights here. So when we talked to Joe about how he does the budget for both the rec and the, his budgeting strategy, you see a lot more sort of changes, both increases and decreases on the right side relative to some of the other budgets in town. And basically the way he likes to do the budget, he says is very conservative about maintaining his, um, his uh, funds, his retained earnings funds. But then when he's looking at each line item, basically looks at what he's actually spending and he adjusts his budget to what he feels he's actually spending. He thinks more about what he's actually spending than what, you know, make it match last year so that it looks like a 0% change. Right, so overall, um, some of the changes that you see would be, um, for example, the equipment buildings ground item, 5203, there's an increase of 20,000. And we asked him about that and he said, basically that is the 70,000 is more, matches more closely what they're actually spending because he had been using some of the rec resources to pay that in the past. Um, but the 70,000 is just a little bit more accurate. Um, we were super impressed by his decrease in natural gas usage. And again, he just said that 32,000, the decrease to 32,000 from 45,000 in the budget was just that their, their actual natural gas bills are low. So fantastic. Um, the end result of this is they're expecting a budget of spending $688,987 and are matching that with revenues of the same amount, 600. 8,787. Um, one of the significant, okay, so, so when you look at page 183, the, the last two columns on the right are completely arbitrary. <laughs> Ignore those two columns entirely. Those are somehow got cut and pasted from some previous budget. Hmm. So the 2024 budget number is correct. The 2025 budget number is correct. But when it tells you dollar change and percent change, those numbers are made up. Ignore those. We've asked the town manager for a corrected version. Hopefully that'll come eventually. But you can just eyeball them and see where there's a change. Um, when, when there's an increase in his expected revenue for admissions fees, public skating, we asked him about that. He said he's both charging more per ticket for public skate, but also that they found that there's a huge demand for public skating sessions, especially during school vacations. So he said when it's school vacation week, they just open up the rink and they have been making a lot more money. Um, Register. 
the item we asked about non ice rentals. If you run an ice, ice skating rink, what are, you, what are you renting that's not ice? And it turns out it's things like school dances um, when, the, when the space is not actually functioning as a rink, you can hold a dance in there. Um, let's see. Things. Oh, yeah, there was a question about retained earnings. So the retained earnings balance currently for the rank is $82,042. So his strategy on retained earnings is he spends some each year and looks to put in a little bit more. So his retained earnings is very conservative about it, he says. And um, yeah, it goes for the rank. It has been going up a tiny bit each year. He doesn't. He doesn't pull that money out if he doesn't need it. So he kind of hopes to balance out with uh, better revenue than he budgeted. But he's budgeting fifty thousand. But he's budgeting fifty thousand. So I forget how I make a motion for a <laughs> for a um. So you, you motion both numbers. Okay. So I will move approval of the. Ed Burns Arena Enterprise Fund budget for expenses in the amount of $688,987 and revenue in the amount of $688,787. Second. So the, the expenses are 688787? Yeah. Sorry, did I miss yeah, six eight eight seven eight seven. Sorry, sorry. So there's a motion to be seconded. Any further questions? Maybe. Thank you. Does anybody think it's odd that those numbers match so perfectly? The revenue and expenses? Yeah. Like, no, it's not purpose. Yeah. yeah. So I would think. Well, how can, the actual how can it be the actual? The actuals don't match perfectly, as you'll I've noticed. But it, when you're budgeting, you, you balance it out. Otherwise, you'd either be budgeting a deficit or a surplus, which just wouldn't be a thing. To so do. it's just that it's a budget as it's it goes to budget. Yep. Okay. It sort of has to be a balanced budget. Yeah. It's just, okay. If you notice under the, um, the actuals, there is a balance of 9,000, 13,000, which is the difference. Yeah. Okay. But it's funny, they look negative, but they're actually positive. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. You, don't, you don't want those numbers to not be in parentheses when okay. you look at the yeah. actual balance. Yeah. Okay. Thank That's you. where his retained earnings come from. Right. Michael and then Grant. What's the debt service? Debt oh, service. God. So there is a complicated ownership arrangement that we discussed last year. I can look up the details. About <laughs> who owns what. Sorry to ask. Because parts of it are owned by DCR, but we have to maintain it. And we have a 99 year lease or something mm -hmm. ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Yes. But the debt is for the DCR owns it. We have a lease, but we had to do the repairs to it. Right. And then that's, that's where the debt is. Yes. Yeah. Yes, that was going to be my next question. Uh, is there, you know, is there a reserve or, or does the money come from somewhere else for uh, the eventual rebuild of the heavy pieces of the infrastructure? Well, I don't have that answer, but it looks like Charlie might. Thank you. So uh, the, um, the infrastructure improvements, whether it's a Zamboni or improving the electrical plant in the uh, arena all, all those improvements over the years have been in the capital budget um, and they apparently will continue to be in the capital budget and and so at least in my memory there was a an agreement between the uh, recreation department and the uh, capital planning committee that the town would pay a certain portion of the debt service and a certain portion of the debt service would come out of the uh, Retained earnings out of the enterprise fund, and and that's what you see here. So so the you know the debt that that's debt service. So the actual expenditures might be five hundred thousand dollars or something like that being paid over a number of years. 
Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Grant. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just have to say, I like how this person budgets, although mm -hmm. I hate to do the budget, <laughs> but uh, it's much more realistic and much more, it's, I like, to, I like how this guy does his budget in terms of basing it more on what happened as opposed to no changes yeah. making it flat. So he, he also has the freedom though to decide how much he charges people for things, right? Yeah. yeah. So it gives him that. You know, well, who else has to budget by changing ticket prices? Uh, Joe, Joe's stuff runs much more like a business than any other part of the town. So it's, it's a very different but budget more conversation. Of a, more of a proprietorship. Yes. Right, right. Exactly. As opposed to a corporation that orders a company. Thank you. Um, I'm John. Uh, just going back to debt service, if you look at the capital plan, there are offsets from the rec and rank that, that match what's in the enterprise fund. So the enterprise fund says an expenditure of 56000 for the debt service. It comes back to the capital plan as, as an offset. So it's all at your town. Yeah. yeah. So, well, I mean, it's, it's, it's the, the capital plan is where the money is borrowed and the you know debt service gets transferred from the capital plan to the rank. But it's sort of like an offset. But, yeah. but if you look at the capital plan, you'll see lines for rank and rec. That's what it was. Do you know when we retire that debt? Probably already, always something there because you're replacing the sand yeah. every certain number of years. And I think the last one was for the yeah. HVAC. For yeah, yeah. 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 That, 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 that was a big one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you'd have to look at the capital plan literally and okay. see, and then probably Alex is carrying a line in the the debt service probably plan. in the auto yeah. the ACFR. Yeah. I think there's a page in the mm -hmm. capital plan that has a debt service by mm -hmm. yeah. I mean in the, in the capital report it's not necessarily yeah, it's not in, uh, right in the public yeah. 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 actually yeah. in the finance uh, yeah. yeah. the yeah. Burns yeah. Arena Enterprise Fund has debt yeah. outstanding at a year end of 375000 Town made fifty five thousand principal payments during the year. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, we have a motion has been seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Uh, all opposed? All right, unanimous. Um, do you have another budget? Um, I think to the recreation department, please, which is on one eighty five. So this is the same department head again, Joe Connolly, with a similar um, budgeting strategy. Um, he started our meeting by telling us that fiscal year 2023, he felt went great, and he was able to add a couple hundred thousand dollars back to the reserves. So the um, retained earnings, balance of retained earnings for the recreation department is $1,342,424. dollars are going to be hearing more about that in a minute because Plan to use some of that. Um, in general, he says the demand for recreation department program is very high. The registrations are way up. He expects uh, fiscal year, the actuals for fiscal year 24 to track his um, name. And, and yeah, he watches every month and sees the trend of generally the revenue going up due to the demand for the programs. The big change that they're expecting in the recreation department this year is that the kid care programs, which are a preschool program and an after school program for K to five or K to six, are going to be moving back to the or moving to the permature school. So you may recall the permature school has been temporarily used to house the public preschool, monogamy preschool, that's a branch of the Arlington Public Schools. They've been using it during the rebuild. So it's in decent shape, it's been used as a preschool. Um, but once the now that the public preschool has been moved into the high school building, the furniture is turning over to the recreation department. Um, so he is planning to use a sizable chunk of his reserves. If you look at use of retained earnings, the very bottom of page 188 is a very large use of retained earnings. And a lot of this is toward the um, 
upgrade of the furniture in order to house preschool and after school there, but also to expand the capacity significantly. So there's a significant demand in town for the kind of preschool program that the rec department runs is very um, reasonable in price compared with some of the things in town. So he said it compares, it compares favorably to, well, it's comparable to things like the Boys and Girls Club preschool or the Fidelity House preschool um, being at least somewhat affordable to many families. Um, and that they're, so he's hoping that once they move into the Carpenter and have a year or two of transitional year, they expect to expand their, basically double their preschool enrollment, expand their after school, which is currently running in the kids' gym by 40%, and then be able to use some of the space that will be after school programming for you know elementary school children. They'll use that in the daytime for programming for toddlers. So they'll also make revenue for that. Um, he does expect when they when they move the preschool and after school to the new facility, he's going to have some uh, need for additional staffing to support what he calls a classroom model. So right now in the after school, they have all the kids in one big gym space, and it's fairly easy to maintain a appropriate ratio for licensing purposes if you just have a certain amount of adults and a whole pile of kids. But once you separate them out into classrooms by age, and you have younger kids here, middle grades, older kids, um, he's going to need some increased staffing in order to maintain the, uh, maintain the ratios. So when you look at these budgets, the no school things, yeah, include the fact that the use of retained earnings, as we talked about, is going to go way up. Um, in order to expand. Another one thing you notice on the salary page, which is 189, um, one person who had a fairly significant raise was the last employee is the co-director of Kid Care. Kid Care is the preschool and after school. Um, previously, they had a model of a director and an assistant director, but they promoted that person to being co-director, and there. Uh, their raise. Let's see, what else can I tell you? Oh, oh yeah. And mm -hmm. um, one of the things that you will notice if you're looking at the expenses on the rec side is you'll see a bunch of blank lines, and then you'll see lines that say fall CR and CR and TV, so on and so forth. He's still in the process of transferring his budget to a model where he's keeping track of the cost and the income from contracted services versus in-house supported services and sort of giving him a finer brain to look at which things make money and which things don't. Um, and I think he, he also said he was going to get a little bit of money back on the move to Armentor because he's not actually paying the full rent. For that building, he's probably taking on some maintenance expenses, and there will probably be some kind of uh, fee to the town, something gray bill. But um, he's getting out of a rented space for the preschool, so um, I think he really sees that as uh, a, a area of future growth for the rec department for both earnings and for providing that service to the town at a reasonable cost. Um, and we did. As you know, as Rebecca said, he's comparing himself to other relatively low cost preschools. He's not trying to run this like a private business. He really is trying to continue to be a public service, which I thought was kind of important. And not be seeing it as this big profit center and making a ton of money, but that it's it makes it a service affordable for people in town who might not be able to pay for a fancy private program. Um, just to add to that, of the rent on the Mass App storefront where they currently run the preschools in town, which is about $40,000. So they yeah. won't be the, the so rent. They'll be getting that back. Um, well, those were the kind of the highlights. You have a motion. So I would like to move the 
budget for the recreation department enterprise funds with expenses in the amount of $2,632,205 and revenues of $2,632,205. Second. Second. Questions? Charlie, Sophie, Grant. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, uh, Rebecca, uh, you, did you say what the balance was in the, in the Senate Price Fund? Yes, for the Recreation Department, $1,342,424. This was last uh, June. Um, this is I, that's a no. That's a live number when I when okay. he asked okay. me. So, um, so that means that um, he's got about three and a half years of being able to use this four hundred fifty thousand dollars to retain earnings. So he does not. The, the four hundred fifty thousand is a temporary bump up due to the. So eventually, this is about the transition, oh. more so than that it will be 450000 every year. So, because he was actually, a couple of years ago, he was producing 300000 a year in a uh, retained earnings. That's right. So, let's see, do you have the number for last year? What yeah, the balance was? Uh, 22 and 23 actual, so yeah, 300000 more. I don't think that he anticipates that it, in talking to him about this, he felt like he was being cautious, just that he might use that money and then have some, you know, surface paint and fix to do when he moves in. <laughs> and he also has this need to possibly increase staff or increase his staff's credentials, but he's also expanding capacity. He just can't predict the income from that capacity until it fills up. It turns out that the Monotony preschool is no longer necessarily going to have slots for teachers who've been bringing their kids there. And so he may get some business from high school teachers who have been using that preschool um, that then come to his preschool instead. And I think they expanded capacity. So I think his feeling was he might not use the 450, but he wanted to be safe on his budget and that it's a one shot deal. He's not going to use it every year to support that program. That program is going to support itself after that capacity kicks in and it's starting to earn what he thinks it can earn. Um, and Joe's a pretty smart guy and I think he would pivot if he didn't feel like it was sustainable or growing. So. If, if it helps to add to that, he also said that his best guess is that after he uses that 450000 he will return at least 200000 the retainer. Yeah. Sophie, um, I'm going back to what I've been asked for the town manager. Um, is Cape Care limited to Arlington residents or is there a priority for Arlington we residents? Didn't ask about that question. I, we didn't ask. Okay. I hadn't thought about it before, but as I was yeah. seeing all these numbers and yeah. overrides and increases, and it's actually something we pay for in our project, right? No, actually, this is no, no. the preschool pays for itself. Pays for itself. Okay. All the rec programs pay for themselves. Period. So all of rec and rec is. That's the point of the enterprise. Um, I mean, if you if we were supporting it, you would see a line called transfer of funds, and. We, the transfer from general fund is zero for rec this year and it was zero for length this year. So, is that true even for salaries? Even for salaries. Just, and health insurance and yeah. all that? It's health insurance. Okay. Yep. And just to foreshadow for some of the other enterprise funds, some of the other enterprise funds do get a transfer from the general fund. Okay. So, you'll, yeah. you'll see that maybe next week. Right? These, these two are self support. Which isn't a reason for him not to prioritize right. Arlington residents. Yeah, I would like that to it's prioritize Arlington residents. <laughs> Maybe that he does. I just, it didn't come up in the meeting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Sure. And it makes sense that, sure. That's a female ask. Sure. Sure. But we're going to go for budget anyway, right? 
<laughs> but we're going to vote the budget anyway. Yes, yes, yes. 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 <laughs> uh, Grant and then Al Jones. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, on the expense line um, involving the reservoir, it's a 528912 um, expense correlation. And um, it's curious, it's, we're not either not budgeting for it or we're combining it into I supplies. Think, I think it's combined, yes. Or are we not even no, doing it? It's combined into supplies. It's still using it for you. Yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, um, um, the the manager's uh, increases are the twenty thousand dollar increase in field maintenance, and it's not in the DPW budget. I'm just wondering if it's but I can't find it in this budget. I'm just wondering where that got like you know. Oh, that's weird. It should be in DPW. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, contracted services. It's probably in contracted services and natural resources. Contract yeah. Okay, because there's a separate line of field maintenance of 60,000. Yeah. I think I think that, that is think it's somewhere else. Yeah, I think that line item is the actual oh. budget town employees do and then the, the contract and services you know, Okay, I'll check that. Okay. Thank you. Uh right. Um so if we can you go back and back to the question that I've been on but not tonight for some reason. What about so health insurance is covered? What about um like in, uh, workers comp insurance or insurance in case of, I mean, in all these kids, like I worry about, you know, kids getting hurt or whatever, there's town liability bill that wouldn't be covered. I, that is a good question. I do not know that it's not aligned for it here. I just, and I, I wonder, because a lot of preschools, private preschools carry probably a lot more insurance related to working with children, you know, or something. And I, yeah, how is the town covered on things like that? I can ask that of the HR director when we do insurance. The workers' comp insurance is in the HR budget. Right. And so I guess there are two insurance questions, really, right? Workers' comp, and then if there's an accident with a child, what liability insurance. What, whatever liability that? insurance is related right. to this in our program. And other rec. I mean, I'm sure there are waivers, I think. I know, at least for activities, yeah. right? Parents sign waivers. Yeah. Yeah, I so don't know about kid care when it's a full time preschool program. We, we didn't ask about that. We didn't ask about that. Yeah. Yeah. If, you, if you can inquire, and Carolyn, if you can yeah. inquire, then that will trust. Any other questions? All right, there's been a motion that's been seconded. All in favor say yes. 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 Any opposed? All right, begin. Um, any other budgets for tonight that we can do in 10 minutes? Do you want to do the assessment? We can do the assessment for the board. Let's do it. <clears throat> 10 minutes, really? It depends on, I mean, I can let's, do let's my start presentation. It. Let's do it. Question of the week. Sarah, can we? Uh, yep. Actually, this is the assessors. Oh, this is it. Okay. Oh, so fifty one. Fifty two. Okay. So board of assessors, um, next half page. Um, we had a meeting yesterday. Charlie and I met with Dana Mann, the director of assessments. Slide. Sorry, yeah. Some some basic data just on this. Um, we have about fifteen thousand five hundred parcels, uh, twenty thousand four hundred sixty households, which is a number I'm sure many people know at this point. Um, four hundred businesses, and then a breakdown of about eight thousand one families, forty one hundred condos, two thousand two families, two hundred seventy four three families, and about one hundred twenty four many other. Many other types, many other uh, living unit codes. Uh, this is the assessor's budget. Um, so I'll go through the lines on this. Um, this is just a slide on there. Um, so let's go to the next slide and I'll just go through the line items. Our first positions the positions were stable. Uh, there was nobody that either left or came or no new positions. Um, and 
I still verify the steps against the classification and Dana told me he actually went to the main contract, made sure all the steps were okay. So that's good. Uh, next, please. Uh, the line items, and that's gonna be hard to read. So I'll just, I'll say it loudly. So the stipends are, yes, another clothing allowance from the union contract. Um, the auto allowance is because the inspectors actually have to go around and visit properties so they can bill their 67 cents a mile. Um, computer maintenance is the Patriot software, which has two components. Um, one called uh, Computer Assisted Mass Appraisal, or CAMA, which is their system for the inputs, creating evaluations. And then some you may be familiar with is the online web pro where you can go look up um, residences. And so abatement requesters can actually do like some real searches on that, you know, say this many colonials and you know, this age and all of the other things. Um, and obviously other people can do that too. Um, the in-state travel is conferences and training for Dana and uh, the deputy um, data collector, rather, Mr. Suarez. Um, consulting is mainly uh, when things go to the appellate tax board, and I'll explain that process a little bit. Um, at that point, um, they may need counsel and possibly an expert witness. As Dana said, he's well-versed in this stuff, but when you have to go to court, you need somebody with qualifications and they have a stable of people that they use for that. Um, he also did warn that 2025 is a recertification year. So that means lots of reports to the DOR and he may have to purchase some consultation from Patriot for that. And then finally, the otherwise unclassified is, um, as he said, was the time clock stamp service and some printer cartridges. So next slide. So that's, that's the budget part. Um, the abatements. So he said, as of now, there's 43 requested. The deadline is actually tomorrow. Um, so there were 43 last year. I asked him how many will go, they'll go to the board of assessors and how many will get modified. He said about a dozen. He also said about a dozen will get appealed to the appellate tax board. Those tend to be large commercial properties because otherwise it's not worth it because there's just not enough of the tax discrepancy there to fund things. If it goes there, um, it gets negotiated. They use the comparative sales model, which is a real estate appraisal, but also the net operating income of commercial property. Um, both of those can be used to, but it basically means there'll probably be some horse trading and they'll figure out a number in the middle. Um, and then that's it. You actually can't go to the court. He hasn't break down yet. He said he's never heard of it. So I suspect that means you really can't. Um, next slide. Um, the overlay accounts. So this was kind of touched on by the town manager. This is controlled by the board of assessors. It funds the abatements, exemptions, any adjustments from the appellate tax board, not the lawyers, because that's funded elsewhere, and any unpaid collections. And it's got about 3.136 million in it. Um, and as you saw, as they mentioned in the Longhorns plan, it adds about 600K to that overlay reserve, which is line G, and then they deduct about 450K of the surplus and that goes back to revenue. And he said, that's about a five year average. So, uh, you know, that's basically just budgeting. Um, if they need to, <clears throat> they want to budget a generous number, but it generally tends to come back. Okay, next slide, what else is there here? Okay, the revaluation. Um, so we don't appropriate anything this year. We appropriated a hundred grand last year because we had to for the state. Um, that'll be, Revaluing commercial and industrial properties and reinspecting what they call personal properties in the business, you know, your bid, computers, copy maker, kitchen equipment, whatever. Um, that bid came in much lower than he figured. It was level with 19 with 2020, you know, drive against inflation. So 57.3K. Um, and then the market revaluation of properties now happens every year. It used to be every three. Um, so that's where we are with revaluations. And then the next slide. Um, this is a sort of interesting thing. It's moving to cyclical inspections. So with that 42.7K left over from that appropriation, they would like to, rather than doing all the properties in year nine of the 10-year cycle, because the state requires you to re-inspect every 10 years, 
they want to use 37K of that, or they're, they're thinking about using 37K of that for doing like 1,500 you know, inspections you know, this year, and then 1,500 the next year, and then so on for five years. That would meet the state requirement. And then at that point, they could do one, like 750 residents a year. And that'll spread out the cost of this and the effort of this. Um, it can potentially capture new growth sooner, especially in the first five years, because you may be off cycle. After that, it'll be every 10 years, but you're still looking at it. And they said it would probably be a contracting expense. They probably would hire someone for that. So given that change in the inspection model, I figured that was worth mentioning. And then finally, well, they mentioned it. Uh, what is the override applied? They mentioned this to the manager that hit 50% hits the August and November tax bills and 50% May. Feb in May 2025. Many of you may already know that, but you know, the thousands of people that will read this, you know, listen to this report may uh, <laughs> find it interesting. <laughs> that and that is uh, that's it. Thank you. And uh, questions. Do you have a motion? Oh, actually, sorry, I have to make the motion to. Uh, uh, I have to. Do you want to see my book? I got it. So I move the uh, taxation total of $344,942. Second. Any questions? So very quickly. Um, I don't remember if we've asked this in the past, but on the assessors themselves on the salary line, three of them, they have salaries. Is that tied to them being elected? Or is that, what's the, I mean, compared to other Commission, you know, committees right. and things that don't. It's significant. They each get five thousand minus one hundred. Right. But, no. I mean, it's a stipend. I think it's, it's like you know, the yeah. select board right. gets a certain amount, and right. school right. committee gets a certain amount. That's just the amount. Well, that they get. I was just curious because I, I was told they only meet like once a month. I'm wondering, do you know how much time they spend, and is it worth? Well, um, not to I start a fight between them, but I'm just you know, added up that's fifteen thousand when we're talking about how positions are happening during that. Yeah, I didn't ask um, Ada. I mean, he may, I'm not sure how comfortable he would have been. <laughs> I, don't, I, <laughs> could, I can tell you how it works for the select board, and there is, I, and I believe we now pay the school community. It's a small we stipend do. compared to the amount of time you're generally putting in. Um, and it has not gone up in decades, and neither has the select board. But the difference is we we see them on TV. We know what the school committee right. does, at least on camera, and much more than that. We know what the select board does right. on camera, and much more right. than that. Well, they have more meetings too, like the select board. So what the assessors meetings. are doing is, when a taxpayer comes to them and says, "You're charging me too much tax," they're, I believe this is true, they're assessing whether or not that person has a case. Okay, so that is a big part of the job, and then supervising and hiring the director of assessment. Actually, not anymore. Absolutely. Well, they don't hire them directly, but they are. They're very Also, um, the assessors can also hear like financial hardship cases. So no, I didn't ask. I, you know, I, I can try to ask Dana, like just roughly how much is he seeing? Because I'm pretty sure he's going to be involved with most of what they're doing. Right. So he would probably have a pretty good beat on the, you know, how often do they meet, how many hours a month, things like that. But you know, at the same time, whatever professional rate they might charge, it's probably going to get used up pretty fast. Yeah. Right. It's ten and just a point of ten o'clock. Any more questions? Or it's over. What's the point of is it a point of information on the topic? I think yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. I just saw the forty nine hundred dollars. It used to be five thousand dollars, and it's by by a bylaw many many years ago. These are three elected positions. If it was five thousand dollars, they'd be entitled to retirement and health insurance. Wow. And <laughs> under right. the reform a few money. years ago, they dropped it to less a hundred dollars, forty nine hundred dollars, and they're not entitled to retirement purposes. Um, you like it, and they're not entitled to health anymore to health insurance. Same thing for the uh, people coming on the board of selectmen or the school committee. Yes. So that benefit has been taken away. Charlie, how you find out? And that's uh, well. I, I would just note that I had a, <clears throat> a little discussion with one of the assessors about thirty years ago. Dan Purcell, he was a little crotchety old guy. He, first thing he wanted to know was what my address was. 
<laughs> I do not believe the current members would ask you that question, Charlie. But if they do, I'm just I telling you that it's a touchy <laughs> subject. <laughs> it's not to get a good one. Any more questions? On the yeah. assessor's side, we should vote it. All right, we have a motion. It's been seconded. All in favor say yes. 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 Any opposed? All right, yes. Thank you. I know fire and police will be ready on Monday. What else will be ready on Monday? Rebecca? Special. Instruction? I just remembered the answer to a question that came up uh -huh. about libraries. Would you like me to answer now or you can hold well, it? Will anyone else have budgets ready on Monday? I should have HHS. Okay. I should have HHS. Okay. Um, I, may I, not, I may have to confirm that. All right. So we will have a bunch of budgets on Monday. Rebecca, you have an answer to a question. Alan, you had a question about why the box offset shows up on the budget and the other offsets yeah. do not show up. And I remember the answer to that, which is that the Fox um, shop, one of their missions is to partially support one of their children's libraries because that little amount of money goes towards salary. So, okay. All the other um, uh, outside money goes to support materials. Uh, that would be And that rank debt service does show up in the capital report, not the two or three games that you have. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you.